I just want to ask one, one, one last question because I'm interested in both both of you, both of you in a sense. Yeah, I said that you know from from a Muslim perspective, the question that we're asked to ask is bring the evidence. Yeah, if I were to bring reasonable evidence, which would satisfy some kind of probabilistic reasoning, that the Prophet Muhammad, we believe, is the final prophet, right? That he was a true prophet. Would you be willing to become a Muslim? I wouldn't. Um, I wouldn't dispute a priori the idea that Muhammad was a true prophet. But I don't understand what that means. So like, what, obviously, yeah, yeah. so this is the way I'm going to look at this psychologically again. You know, it's mm. people are granted revelations, and it's obviously the case, let's speak empirically, mm -hmm. that the revelation of Muhammad yeah. united a fractious society. And so it was a uniting revelation. Now, how to conceptualize but it's not a universally uniting revelation, at least not yet or yeah. not now, because we're not all united. So the, why? Well, why? Maybe we didn't understand but, but, the revelation but, but, but properly. Is, That's is, one is, possibility. Is the presupposition what you're saying, that unity is the ultimate objective? Well, not exactly, you know, because okay. then you have the problem of uniformity that you, you pointed out. No, no, out, even, right? even, even the idea of unity itself. I mean, is, is there Well, not... we talked about... Okay, so no, we unity is a great... This. Just to be clear, uh, yeah. I believe that unity is a great objective, yeah. but I don't think it's the all-defining one. For example, um, if, there's a, if there is an injustice that is so great that disunity is more appropriate, then I can imagine situations where disunity is probably better than unity. Right. Uh, I'm sure you can as well. For example, like in well, the Soviet that, Union... That would be a false unity in yeah, some yeah, sense, Yeah, exactly. Right? So right? that's what we're Well, that's about. why you wanted to address the elephant under the yeah, yeah, right away. Exactly. We can't have a false peace. Exactly. And we but, can't incorporate things we can't yet incorporate. Yes. And no. what, what, the reason why I'm bringing this to your attention is because I feel like it's my duty as a Muslim, especially in the mosque, right, to, to, to tell you that um, as Muslims, we believe that the previous dispensations, as they were like Christianity and Judaism, they are part of our faith, in a sense. Not in the sense of believing the doctrines and all of that kind of thing. Like, we obviously don't believe in original sin or the, the resurrection, the crucifixion, all this kind of thing. We don't believe in any of that. Or the Trinity, yeah, of course. Um, but in the sense that we do believe in Jesus Christ, we believe in all of the Old Testament prophets, most of them, if not all of them, you know, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and so on. And we believe that each prophet was sent with two things. The message, which is to believe and worship in one God, and some kind of evidence to indicate their truthfulness. So with, for example, Moses and Jesus, we know what their miracles are, splitting the sea, and we believe that actually happened historically, right? We have no qualms with that. We don't have this kind of materialistic viewpoint on the issue. Uh, with Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we believe that his, because he was sent to all of humanity, he had to have a, an evidence base that would satisfy not just the eyes. In other words, it wouldn't be just something that could be witnessed. It would be something that can be interrogated and scrutinized for all times and places. So it would be an auditory revelation. In this case, it's the Qur'an. The Qur'an means a recitation, yeah? So the, the central message of the Qur'an is tawhid, or the idea of worshipping one God and believing in one God, as we've mentioned. But there are some, there is an attempt in the Qur'an to challenge, like for example, there's something called the falsification test or the inimitability test. The Qur'an says, for example, that try and find a contradiction within the Qur'an had it been from other than God, la wajadu fi ikhtilaf and kathir, we have found in it many contradictions. It's the, this inimitability challenge is to produce something as sophisticated as it in terms of the linguistic composition as well as the structural component. Um, this is very interesting because now even Western academics like Angelica Neuris and others have said that this, met, this challenge has not been met. So a German uh, orientalist, she's recently said this. Um, so this is another thing. And then you have a range of prophecies, for example. Like if you look at Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 21, it's mentioned in the Bible that one of the mark hallmarks of a true prophet is that, or a false prophet, is that when they talk about the future, that it will be false. But the Quran makes very specific, very specific prophecies about the future. For example, in chapter 30, verse 2 to 4, it says, غُلِبَتُ الرُّمْ فِي أَدْنَ الْأَرْضِ وَهُمْ بَعْدِ غَلَبِهِمْ سَيَغْلِبُونَ that the Romans had been defeated. At that time, there was the Sassanid Empire and the Roman Empire, and they were in war with each other. And that from three to nine years, that they would defeat the enemy, you see? It gave very specific timelines. It gave very specific... And this was a very risky type of uh, prediction, because if you got it wrong, then it would endanger and undermine the entire prophethood of the Prophet Muhammad. But it did happen. And in fact, you'll find historical things which are not even in the Quran. And Rome was defeated? 
that Rome, no, that the that Persians, sorry, that the Romans had been defeated by the Persians in a battle. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so that's it's mentioned, in, for example, the Chronicles of Theophanes, which is a primary source material outside of the Quran Sunnah. Um, you can find it now, it's even translated into English. He he clearly mentions that um, eight years after this particular prediction took place, it did ha happen like that. So we have a range of predictions, even that relate to the current day. The Prophet said that the, the barefooted Arab, they will be uh, competing for the highest building. That sexually transmitted diseases would be proliferated as a result of people having intercourse outside of marriage, and that this would be something that would be uh, diseases that had never been there in the past. Uh, the interest rate, uh, interest-based economy that we live in is mentioned by the Prophet Muhammad. I said in the future, interest will be everywhere. Whoever does not consume it, he will not be able to evade its dust. So th this is another thing. So for example, um, you've got a range of prophecies where Islam will spread country by country. Where, you know, this is mentioned, he's going to go, uh, there's a hadith that says, that the earth has been expanded for me. I saw its west points and east points. And my nation will reach its uh, points, what was projected, and it's saying east and west. If you look at the Islamic expansion, I mean, Barnaby Rogerson, yeah, who is a historian, he said that the similitude of the Muslims going eastward and westward and conquering the amount of countries that they conquered in that early period, which you can read in the, the book that I've given you, is like Eskimos taking over Russia and America. That's what he said, Barnaby Rogerson. On the point of pro prophecies, even people like Edward Gibbons, they agree that the prophecies of the Quran had been met. So, so I have to ask. Yeah. So I don't, I, don't, I don't understand the question exactly. He wants to I'm, know if you'll convert to Islam. No, I'm saying that. No, that wasn't. <laughs> I mean, that's the question. Well, look, I would say to some degree, it's not up to me. No, no, but, sense, but my question was, but my, just to remind you, the question was, if I gave you evidence that would satisfy a certain level of probabilistic... No. You say you wouldn't? No, because that isn't how I evaluate the situation. How would you evaluate it? This is the crux. Well, I'm Muslim enough to have been invited to your mosque. No, no, you're always invited. No, even if no, you're no <laughs> but I mean, I mean this specifically. Yeah, I mean yeah. this very specifically, you know. Um, I don't think in some sense, it's a very complicated problem. Okay. You know, when, when people meet me on the street, they'll say things like, I met a couple of Orthodox Jews in New York, yeah. and they said to me on the street that they call me rabbi, which was... It's a hell of a thing to hear, you know. And so, and then I have Muslim people who are listening to my biblical lectures. Mm. And more and than that, they more say, than that, by the way. Yeah. Yes, yes, and more than that. And, mm. you know, they say, well, Peterson doesn't know it yet, but he's really a Muslim. And, <laughs> and, and that's very, um, that's an honor, you know. Mm. Just like it was an honor to be approached by these Orthodox Jews. And, and, that, that hasn't only happened once, and I've had lots of correspondence with people, and the same thing has happened with the Orthodox Christians, and to some degree the Catholics, and less or so the Protestants, but, and so I don't know exactly what to make of that. We talked about this a little bit, yeah. and let's talk about proof, you know. Well, for me, the proof of faith is the attractiveness of its adherence. Mm. And that's something to think about, right? Well, are you a shining example of the Muslim faith? Well, how hard do you shine?